and thank you very much indeed. Um, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, is that a bit loud? Mic two, is it a bit loud? Is that okay? Um, thanks very much for the invitation to be here. It really is a privilege and a pleasure to be here and to come and speak about the NHLS and pathology and public health surveillance in the country. And um, this talk probably is a reflection of my own journey from clinical virologist through to public health practitioner and, uh, and maybe illustrates some of the diversity of, of pathology in the country where one can extend one's influence from the laboratory into public health. But in preparing this, this lecture, I did speak to a few of the colleagues and, 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 and asked them what they would be interested in. And given that I'm not at the coalface in a laboratory, the answer was that it would be useful and interesting to give some kind of perspective from my perspective, from a governor's perspective, on, on where the NHLS is and to give some insight as to some of the management challenges and the, and the governance challenges that then trickle down to your space because your space is at the coalface within which you battle with, with a whole bunch of things. Um, and, and, and what I hope to do is give you some sense of that. Now, Landon was very generous in the time allocation, and the good news is that I'm not going to take up the two hours that he allocated to this. So, um, I, I, and, but it, is, um, it was advertised as a conversation, and I'm very happy to take questions uh, and, and either as we go along or afterwards. So um, let's get on to it. And, 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 and what I thought might be useful for those that, of you that don't know the NHLS is to give some introductory comments on how did we get you and how did it start then move on to the current status of the NHLS, the reforms to the platform, and then conclude with some, uh, some comments on embracing the future. So we'll start in with the birth of it and some of its strengths and weaknesses, uh, then move on to the current status, financial, legal, and people issues, and then the various reforms that are underway at the moment. And I hope to be able to convey to you that although sometimes sitting on the board is a, is, a, is a distressing thing to be because of the acute challenges that the organization uh, has. I hope that by the end of it, I'm able to convey to you that within those challenges, there are a very committed group of board members, a very committed uh, senior executive team, as they remain, as we'll see, uh, that are committed to good governance and moving the NHLS into a better future. So let's get going with how did we get here. So, this audience doesn't need much introduction to pathology. It's a major driver of pathophysiology, and about 70% of clinical decisions are based on a uh, pathology result. And indeed, uh, the first employees in this faculty were pathologists. And uh, many of us think of pathologists as backroom lab rats, but in fact, we're very cool people. And in fact, the world is embracing pathologists as the coolest of the lot. And we're now known for getting out there and, and solving major global uh, challenges. And we hang out with Matt Damon and Morgan Friedman and others solving the world's problems. And just don't, don't ever forget that it was pathologists who coined the term, not that everybody has a secret, but that everybody has a secret. And uh, this has taken us across the globe. But the, the truth of it is that in the mid-1990s, under a new administration, a new paradigm of health for all rather than a segmented and prejudicial paradigm, there was an opportunity to reflect on pathology service and to look at the provincial fragmented service, the fact that the SAIMR, the South African Institute of Medical Research, that was started with funding from the mining industry um, and focus on occupational health, in fact, uh, had, had a fairly dominant position, but that it wasn't alone and it was fairly fragmented. The National Institute of Virology was an important player and was the de facto uh, virology department for WITS. And then there was also the NIOH that was, had, a, had a, a fragmented uh, uh, presence in the country. We also had a, a, a clear delineation between public and private uh, with the, the one having a service uh, mandate or a service role, whereas the public sector had a broader mandate. And this really created a reflection that allowed for a mandate opportunity. What are the opportunities associated with creating a national health laboratory service? Well, the NHLS was then born in 2000 with a, the NHLS Act that was, uh, was passed. And this was a major a transition within which the National Health Laboratory Service had various divisions. And that, although some people think of NIOH and NICD as, as separate entities, in fact, they're merely divisions within the NHLS. And the NHLS then 
had three mandates entrenched in law. It was service, it was teaching training, and it was re research. And whenever people say the primary mandate of the NHS is service, I repeatedly uh, say to them, no, the primary mandate is threefold, and it's important to bear that in mind. That it's not just on a whim, it's entrenched in law what we are supposed to be doing. And the NHLS has grown into a very, very substantial organization. On the bottom left is the distribution of DOH facilities, and on the top right is the distribution of the almost 260 NHLS laboratories that serve approximately 80% of the population with a staff of more than 7,000 people. And we do uh, uh, over 90 million tests a year with obviously what's called the, in, the National Priority Program taking a very dominant position in, 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 in prisons, but in fact they account for uh, about 5 million tests on the HIV nucleic acid tests and about uh, 5 million at peak on, on, on TB gene expert with a whole lot more uh, with, with the, 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 the vast spectrum of t tests that are provided. To add to it, in addition to training registrars, running P4 facilities, and doing the myriad of, of scientific work, the cost of the NHLS is between 27 and 50 percent of the private sector. And I think it's a tribute to the NHLS that it does manage to keep its, uh, its costs down to this degree. But to be, to be frank, it was not an easy transition in 2000, 2001, as it started to, to emerge. It was a logistic challenge of note to merge fragmented organizations and fragmented provinces, some of which didn't want to be amalgamated and were actively obstructive to that process. And the NHLS also ran, ran into political headwinds, which remain to date. And the provinces, uh, uh, some of them wanted to, to be absorbed into this, but some did not. Notably, the, uh, the, the uh, KwaZulu-Natal did not want to be absorbed and acted against the law for two and a half years in that the NHLS Act said in no uncertain terms that they had to procure services from the NHLS and they, and they bluntly refused to do this. There were various compromises that were reached in order to get that buy-in, one of which was that the board became an unwieldy group of 24 people and that every single province got a representative on the board. And this has challenges right up till date and into the future in that boards by, by law have to be uh, non-partisan. You cannot go in. I don't represent anybody except myself when I sit on the board. But having nine pr provincial representatives, each of which have a vested interest in a report to their heads of departments about what's going on, has challenges. And I'm not for one moment casting aspersions on any of the individuals. It just represents the conflicts in the organization that were needed in order to get the buy-in to the national effort. So it was a very challenging environment that the NHLS was born into, and I do not for one moment suggest that the strengths or in the next slide the weaknesses of the organization are a complete list. I'm really looking more from a, from a structural point of view as it emerged. But there's no doubt that one of the greatest strengths of the NHLS as it was born was its staff and its network, a fantastic set of people, not just uh, um, wanting to churn out results in a routine fashion, but strongly entrenched in an academic base, wanting to create public health improvements and, and, uh, and, and improvements to individual patients. There was a depth and breadth of skill which was unusual. Uh, there was a national coverage and a national service, and there were expert committees that emerged which were firmly entrenched in data that was being generated locally as well as being uh, 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 brought, to, brought to the local environment from the international journals. One of the things that is, one of, that is a key strength of the NHLS is the corporate data warehouse. Every single specimen that is tested in any of the 256 laboratories is registered as to what has been done, in what time frame, and, and so it is a very powerful epidemiological tool that came into being early on in the NHLS. It's also important to see that one of its strengths was that it was entrenched in law, which gave it a national footprint, it gave a national ma mandate that with clarity, and as a result of that, it was actually possible to invest more heavily. The fragmented pathology service didn't have the critical mass to invest at a level that was required, but there's a national consistency on quality, and the scale was, was something special. On the weaknesses side, I think that I've talked about the provincial buy-in and the financial compliance issues that have emerged. I think it's true to say that as a state-owned enterprise, it was open to more, more open to political interference and manipulation. 
In addition to that, having all of your eggs in one organizational basket is a challenge. So if I'm a person going to a clinic down the road and that one clinic falls apart, well, it's inconvenient because I have to walk further down the road to the next clinic, but at least there are a series of other clinics around you. Whereas if the NHLS uh, goes into, in, into free fall, it's one organization and will be a, a, it, it will be a substantial challenge. And I think that that's something that we do need to think about. It's also a very complex business model. Uh, you know, we, it's, it's, it is easy to, to, to throw flack at the executives, and sometimes they do deserve it. I, I, I'm quick to, to acknowledge that. But it's probably one of the most complicated jobs in the country running the NHLS. I mean, I don't think there are more than five or ten people in the whole country who can do this job properly. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a very, very complex business model. And then something I wasn't too sure whether to put in the weaknesses or the strength is the, the, the limited recourse that the NHLS has with provinces. If it was a private sector organization, it would have the ability to sue more easily. It would have the ability to put debt collectors in place. It would have the normal mechanisms in place to actually ensure that normal business processes continue. But as a government-owned entity, it is limited by the intergovernmental relations, which don't allow it to do certain things. Now, that's a weakness on the NHLS side, but it's a great benefit for the patient because as a, a, we, we, we still are mandated to provide services to each and every individual patient, even if they're province is not paying, and it's an explicit instruction, we may not terminate services uh, because the province does not pay. And that, uh, that is very challenging, as I'll show you now. And so a complex business model were, became entrenched within which the NHLS is owned by the Department of Health nationally, but services the provinces, and each province then is obliged within the NHLS Act to purchase services, and it's purchasing. It's no different to your Sunday newspaper where you wander down and you get a service or a product and you pay for it. It's, it's, a, it's a very important thing because those that don't pay are in violation of the law. Now, what happens is that National Department of Health then gives money to provinces, and it comes in two forms. Each province gets an equitable share, and the equitable share is based on your population percentage or your pro rata population, and you, you budget for that. But the important part about an, a, an equitable share is that although you budget for health and you budget for water affairs and you budget for all these other things, once you get the money, you can shift money between them. And so, in fact, even the provinces that have budgeted sufficient for pathology services within their health budget can just shift that money out. And it's a very big difference compared to a con conditional grant which in, within which if you get a conditional grant, you have, to, you have to spend it on what you said you spend it, and if you don't spend it, you send it back again. So it's quite an important differentiation because what happens in this environment where almost all provinces are short of money, they're taking money from the places that, that they feel they're going to take least heat from and giving it to the others which are more politically sensitive or where communities are, 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 are giving grief. And it's very important to see the difference in, in, in those two. So let's look at some of the current status and what are the current challenges that we are dealing with. Well, I can tell you that uh, I signed up for about uh, eight days a year uh, uh, sitting on uh, work on the NHLS board, and I think I'm at 60 at this stage, and it's only October, and it's this never-ending crisis management of, of balancing income and expenditure, trying to keep creditors at bay, trying to keep the debt, trying to get the debtors to pay. And I think that as a community, um, you, you, you should also be aware, and I'm not talking to about myself, but as the community at large, there's an immense amount of effort being expended from the Ministry of Health downwards to try and solve this problem. But when we look at the root cause analysis, we have to try and find what is the primary issue that drives the issues in your lab when you cannot employ people, when you cannot procure things. And there's no doubt that the primary cause analysis shows that cash flow is the primary issue over here. And I'd like to give you a sense of some of that and then later some of what is happening to overcome that. So let me take you back a year, almost exactly a year. I was sitting in Parliament uh, helping to present the 2015-2016 report over here. And there it showed a revenue growth of about 5.7 up to 6.4 billion. And every business providing is keeping its costs in check should be happy with that. And in addition to that, it gave a surplus in a not-for-profit environment. In a profit environment, you say a prof, uh, there would be a, a profit of, uh, of just under 300 million rand. And yet you couldn't buy anything and you couldn't hire people. And people saying, but you made a profit. And yet we couldn't hire people and, and do the order of business. 
And the reality of this is that people need to understand that this is an accounting process, not a practical on the ground process. Because once you have issued your invoice to the province for them to pay you, even if they don't pay you, it reflects in your books as money that you've received until you've written it off. And therefore, until we formally write that off, that remains as a so-called profit, a surplus in our books. And people often misunderstand, thinking that somehow it's been mis mismanaged uh, in, 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 in the organization because there's a so-called profit. But in fact, until the provinces pay, there's no cash to do anything with, or to do what, you want, what we all want to do with, okay? And so to give you a sense of the magnitude of the problem, the problem over here, this is a, a slide over here with each of the provinces on this side over here. It's correct in July this year. And the outstanding amounts that they owe the NHLS. This is no secret. This is public knowledge. Okay? And what you can see is that suddenly you're adding on more zeros, three zeros to be exact, for two to three zeros for Gauteng and KZN. Okay? These figures above over here, you can see they're all pretty much the same. They're pretty much irrelevant because this is a time frame and you haven't yet paid for last month's bill. So you're inevitably going to have some debt. Okay? So you don't really need to worry about these smaller amounts over here. And in fact, Western Cape has overpaid and Eastern Cape and others pay very well. There's some that pay very well over here. But the problem over here is these two that we need to manage over here. Now, ESCOM gets a huge amount of press about their debt levels, okay? And their debt levels vary between about 7 and 9% of their annual turnover. This is 90% of our turnover, okay? So when, we, when, when you throw flack at the executives, when you cast aspersions on those in leadership for not doing enough, just try and bear in mind that we're dealing with 80 to 90% of annual turnover in debt. And the provinces... And, and there needs to be a civil society movement to get the provinces to pay. Because the NHLS is not actually doing anything or much wrong in this. Sure, we might have a gripe about this or that, uh, but in fact, the service is a good service to every single clinic across the country, but two provinces don't pay. Now, two weeks ago, we're back in Parliament again, and what happens here is that we now, unlike last year where we issued a 279 million rand profit surplus, we're now reporting on a 1.9 billion uh, deficit. How does that happen? How does that happen in one year? Um, and what happens now is that you start to get into the doubtful debt space. And that is when your invoice has not been paid for so long that your auditors come and say, do you really think you're going to get that money? And when you start to ask that question, that adds a whole new dynamic to this over here. And we have to acknowledge that probably about two and a half billion, with a B, of this money is now doubtful debt. And we know that because KwaZulu-Natal used to put a bit of money aside every, every year in their spare bank account in case we took them to court, which we were prevented from doing. But now they don't think we're going to take them to court, so they've gone and spent it on water affairs or something else. Okay? So in fact, it is now doubtful debt that we need to deal with. And because of our pseudo-federal system, national government can't stop that. Even the Minister of Health really has tried to stop them doing that, but isn't empowered to do that. So what do we do with that? Well, first of all, we have to understand debt trend analysis and what happens in, 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 in these environments. Well, firstly, there's a yearly cycle. And as we get sort of January, February, March, with March being the, the annual uh, um, cycle for, for government, uh, um, government budgets, that every province except the Western Cape runs out of money. So to try and force them to pay money when they don't have money is a challenge, and we need to, we need to be sensitive about that. Secondly, some of the budgets are irrational. So there's some provinces for the next financial year, although there's a 4.7% increase in tariffs, have put in a lesser budget for next year than they've spent this year. Okay, so they are, and they would argue, well, they can move between budget categories, but there are some, we need to understand the budgeting processes uh, in provinces. And then we need to tailor our approach to debt according to the provinces. So let me give you an example here. We all villainize KZN, right? And this is a slide year by year of KZN accumulated debt where they haven't paid for more than 90 days. But in fact, although we villainize it and they are larger debtor, they've paid 103% of their bills in the last 12 months. Their problem is old long-standing anger around early days within which the previous management of KZN wouldn't pay their debt. But they love us now. They're paying it all the time. Okay? 
as opposed to Gauteng, which actually paid quite well previously, but they're not paying now. That's not a real figure. That's my estimate, maybe, of where we're going to be in the next financial year over here. Okay? We're already up to 2.6 billion debt with, um, um, with, 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 with Gauteng. But the problem here with Gauteng, I mean, t you know, you can't get something more different than that. Okay? The, the, end, the end one looks pretty similar, but they're very different in trends. And so the way you manage them is very different. And why is that? Well, it's got nothing to do, or well, very little to do with the NHLS. It's got very little to do with health. It's got to do with this. They've run out of money. Okay? So it doesn't matter if we force them to pay us. They're going to stop paying the blood transfusion service or they're going to stop paying for other things. Okay? And we need to bear in mind that the Gauteng Department of Health is so bankrupt that the sheriff is arriving and taking microwaves, computers, desks, and chairs away from them to pay the others that, have, that, that they haven't paid. Okay? And if you look at their medical negligence claims alone, 2010, 2011, their books, they paid out 8 million, which went up to 154 million in 2013, 14. And in 2016, 2017, in their books, which have just closed, they made a contingency for 13 billion rand. That means that their contingency means that if everybody who has already sued them is successful, that's what they'll have to pay out. Okay. Half a billion just at Chris Hani Baragwanath. Okay. So can you see that when, you, when, when there is pressure put on the NHLS to demand the money from Gauteng, you have to say, well, where's the money coming from? So sometimes Gauteng Health Department approves the money for NHLS. That then goes to, Ga to Gauteng Treasury. Gauteng Treasury says we don't have the money. So even health wants to pay us, but Treasury can't. I'm not trying to be morbid. You'll see I'm going to get to the Prozac later. Okay? Um, so uh, it, it's a, uh, there, there is some, some good news coming. But when you sit in your labs and you're wanting to hire people, when your IT system isn't working or the logistics aren't as good as they should be, remember that this is not a lack of intent or will to invest in your laboratory. This is about cash flow. And even if one does have a so-called surplus, there are cash flow issues that prevent this. And we spent endless time trying to balance it and really trying to support you in the labs as much as is possible. So where are the reforms? Where is that Prozac? And the Prozac comes in a slow dose, I'm afraid. And within government circles, what happens is you start to initiate activity now, which then ends up as being policy a little bit later and implemented further on. And we need to bear in mind that almost every government department nationally has either got a flat budget or a decreased budget. So again, if we're going to take money out for NHLS, it has to come out of somewhere else. So what are the financial things? And I, I think fi financial remedies that have been put in place. Well, I think we need to see that there's significant political support for the NHLS at this stage uh, and that there are financial remedies coming in place. So let's review this. So first of all, this is another cartoon of the, what, the earlier one. That is that Department of Health nationally gives to, the, gives to provinces who are then supposed to pay their debts to the NHLS. The first thing that's going to happen is that we're going to put a, the, what has been agreed to is a modified capitation system within which instead of paying over here, there's a small line there because there's a small amount of cash there, but more than 90% of the money will come straight to the NHLS. So we won't have to bill for 90% of the services. Oops, that uh, went back, okay? So we won't have to bill for that. And in addition to that, in a modified capitation system, the money's given in advance, not on invoice. There will still be a small amount of money that's sent to the provinces for, a, for, for a, a, a basket of tests that fall out of the majority of tests, and we will still send invoices. But even if that's the case, it's probably in monetary terms only 5 to 7%, if I remember correctly, of the overall money. So now the first remedy is that we won't have to go begging for money from the provinces. The money's going to come straight from, from Treasury to Health to us and not as a conditional grant, as the equivalent of, a, of an equitable share. And that's a major, major step forward. It comes with risk, though. And the risk that it comes with is that we'll get a lump sum of money that we've got to come out with. And one of the reasons that the system was put in place where provinces had to pay us was that provinces were su supposed to control the request forms going to NHLS. Now the doctors and nurses in the clinics will know that the provinces have no 
issue with what they request. We may put electronic gatekeeping in place that they need to provide certain information and there may be test algorithms, etc. But there isn't going to be a provincial person breathing down your neck if you request too many things uh, on an ongoing basis. So it comes with risk there. Um, uh, and and, and we, we do need to bear that in mind, that there may be a massive increase in, or a significant increase in test requests. The next thing that we're going to see in the NHLS is a more rational pricing. Now, it might come as a surprise to you, but every single test that is colored in red over there is undercharged to the state. It's quite spectacular. I come in the front here. So tuberculosis is a good example. There. You can't actually see this, I'm sorry. But it, it, sometimes we charge only half the price to the state that it costs us. So if they get the surplus part about it, it isn't being, um, we, we're not making ends meet on that front, while HIV services over here, we overcharge for. And in fact, when you do, so there's a whole process uh, along with the expert committee patholo of pathologists to rejig this and make this more accurate. The reality is that the bill to the state is the same and some will go up and some will go down. Um, but it, it is important uh, in terms of planning for the future that we have a rational pricing uh, mechanism and that's been put in place almost as we speak. The next thing that we need to look at is resource allocation as a third element of financial intervention for the, for the, uh, within the NHLS. Now, the NHLS receives that money into its pot, and it's like a pie that the NHLS needs to divide up based on good judgment and the, and the official mandate. And it needs to divide it up across multiple platforms, some of which are entrenched in law. The first three are entrenched in law, pathology service, teaching and training and the research. And then there are the institutes that, that, that are also within the NHLS. But in addition to that, there'll be an Ebola outbreak somewhere in West Africa, and we'll have to fund that as well. There'll be a, a measles outbreak, we'll have to fund that uh, as well. There's, there are a variety of things that need to be funded on an ad hoc basis. But it is a very, very difficult situation for the executives because you create a false competition between a laboratory in the Eastern Cape that's understaffed, that's going to stop serving that community if we don't put a technologist in place, or we need to fund a, a researcher in, a, in, 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 in University A or B. It's a difficult situation because patients' lives are at risk. And so what we have to do is recognize the value of each of those and start to do a budget segmentation. This is where we're going to at this stage. So it might surprise you, but up until relatively recently, the NHLS didn't know what it was spending on its different elements. And it is complicated because all of, almost all of you are on joint appointments and it's this percentage on that and et cetera. There's a, so there's been a process of, of trying to delineate that. And what is happening at this stage is we now are able to quantify the different elements and put them in different pots. And what's happening now is that when we do that, although the NHLS will receive the same amount of money, it will be segmented by DOH, and that DOH at the moment through the provinces is paying for the service, but that will come directly as I explained. The, the NIOH and NICD already receive a separate pot of money, so there's no judgment that needs to take place by board or executives as to how much money to give NICD and NIOH. It's segmented out. And then there's the training and research component, which in theory has been cost, which has been costed out and in theory is, 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 is funded. And I'll come back to this a little bit later. But in fact, the grant that comes to the, the NHLS now, we only invoice the provinces for service. We don't invoice them for any of this anymore. So that's a good step forward. So as research, and, and the money that is being allocated to research in terms of the medium term ex expenditure framework is increased. Uh, but in fact, this part here in this recalculation is underdone by probably more than 50%, and it's a risk, and I want to come back to that in a while. But this is a, for, a, a positive step forward rather than leaving it to, to the executives and the board to decide how much research gets versus service, etc. It's now going to be entrenched in, in, in budget, budget segmentation. So... Let's look at the, so those are the kind of, those are sort of I think it was four different areas within which there's active intervention to try and protect the service, protect the different elements, and make sure that each is adequately funded. 
So let's talk about some of the structure of uh, changes. Well, this is a little thing that I showed earlier, which is the NHLS with its two institutes inside that. But one of the most exciting things that is happening at the moment, even though it's taking some, some cr criticism for, for some of its, uh, its elements, is NAPISA, the National Public Health Institute of South Africa. And this is a bill that's going through Parliament at the moment. There's one more call for, for queries on this, but it should be enacted later next year. And, and, and what the bill provides for is a disease and injury surveillance unit, a specialized public health services with interventions as well, uh, training and research as well as um, ma uh, addressing major health challenges. And, it, and you know, in simplistic terms, this is like the public health institutes, like the CDC, like the, the various um, international agencies that segment off public health uh, uh, institutes. And I think overall it's a very good thing. S certainly some of the stuff that falls within NIOH, NIOH or NICD might come away and go to the MRC. Maybe the MRC is going to lose one or two of its units to NAPISA. But in fact, I think it's a very positive intervention that there's going to be a dedicated uh, organization entrenched in law with a budget that's going to address public health issues. And there are many international models for surveillance, research, and interventions, and I think this is a very positive thing. Also, because rather than at the moment where we're looking at, at occupational health and infectious diseases, it's now going to be non-communicable diseases and uh, violence and injury as well, sort of recognizing the quadruple burden of, of major diseases in the country. And I'm not going to read through the, the aims. It's, it's really analogous to what I've just been saying now. But its functions will be to coordinate surveillance, have specialized laboratories, uh, provide training um, and a work, workforce development, conduct research, and, 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 and support the public health interventions. So what is its structure going to be? And it's something that I think you need to know about because there are definite opportunities for academic institutions to engage and be part of NAPISA because NAPISA is going to be national. It's almost certainly going to be headquartered at the, at the NHLS um, uh, offices in Sandringham. But in the same way that NICD has units here, uh, NAPISA will have units um, all, all around the country. And it's a real opportunity because there will be budget associated with it as well. But essentially what we have is an organization that will have uh, a National Institute of Communicable Diseases, a National Institute of Occupational uh, Safety and Health, and then an, a Non-Communicable Disease Institute and one for Injury and Violence. And within the NAPISA bill that will become an act, what will happen is that that will then segment off into that space there, that will then segment off into that space there, and there will be new institutes that emerge within the PISA to deal with the non-communicable and the injury and violence. And in fact, that whole system's been tested at the moment, and it's been tested, to my mind, in a very unusual way. It was tested with the, the Esidomeni crisis, and yet the emergency outbreak facility with telephones and IT connectivity and everything that was put up for a potential out Ebola outbreak actually became the headquarters of the management team for the Esidomeni challenges. And who would have thought that deaths in a psychiatric environment would have the same infrastructure as an infectious disease outbreak infrastructure at the National Institute of Communicable Diseases? So it's been tested at the moment, this non-communicable side. And as we see this wave of non-communicable diseases emerging in Africa, um, I, I think it's, it's a really important development. And of course, that then feeds up into the usual corporate structures and, 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 and into the Minister of Health directly. But the NHLS is going to lose a significant part of its infrastructure and, and staffing to, the, uh, to NAPISA. Let's look at some of the legal uh, uh, reforms that are happening at the moment. Well, there's the NHLS Amendment Bill, which is going through Parliament as well at the same time as NAPISA. And uh, this is long overdue, and I would like, probably like, I think there are four slides of, of elements that I think are applicable to the academic centres that you should be aware of. The first thing in terms of its mandate, it used to say that the NHLS would provide te teaching and training. And it's shifted the language to supporting, and there was a, all sorts of noise that happened with it. But in fact, it is actually appropriate because it's the universities that train on an NHLS platform, and it's the universities that, that, that give the, the academic um, uh, degrees, etc. And so this is probably a shift in language to reflect what is happening rather than, uh, um, um, rather than shifting its mandate. 
But I think that from a university's point of view, there is a risk in this one, and you may well need to link it to a, a teaching and training grant that isn't in place at the moment for pathology. Um, so, so, so think about it, and this is something that the deanery needs to think about, and the heads of pathology need to think about quite, quite carefully, and work with whoever is the new minister of higher education and training to try and uh, uh, try, try and manage that. Secondly, there is a very subtle shift in the wording around uh, training, and where in the first NHLS Act it said NHLS will train laboratory and associated personnel, and now it says it will train its laboratory personnel. Now, of course, we want to have a fit around this, like, what is that? We train for the country, we train for the region. But in fact, that apparently, and I, I'm saying apparently because I, I don't want to give any legal opinion on this, may actually be beneficial in the, the TTR, the teaching, training, and research environment, because apparently in law, if you put in there that you will train your workforce, Treasury's obliged to give you a grant for that. And that then links up into this previous slide within which you might need a training grant over here. And it appears that the introduction of the word it's is actually a positive thing because now it's obliged to be to do it and therefore it's obliged to fund it. And, and so I think, but it's something that you need to get legal opinion on and you need to get that uh, uh, ascertained um, on your side as well. I think it's a risk. And, and one of the things that I was very surprised about is that the National Health Laboratory Service is one of your most major collaborators, your most major partners in the health space. And yet I've been to Parliament two or three times on the public hearings on uh, the NHLS amendment bill, not one university was there to ask any questions of, 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 of it. And I think that it's something you may need to think about in that I, I really do think that teaching and training is underfunded in the current system. I really do think that there's a threat there. And there is one more round of public comments that uh, is in place. And I would urge you to uh, look at it carefully and, and, and send representatives to uh, ensure that the honorable ministers and, and, their, and their colleagues uh, uh, have accommodated for you. Then there's the composition of the board, and the board, as I said earlier, is quite an unwieldy big group which, which came into, into place. And I think generally there's a positive move in the NHLS Act. It's going to professionalize it. It's going to pay people properly for their time, unlike now where it's virtually pro bono. It will reduce from 24 down to 14, and it will reduce the conflicts of interest. So there still will be three provincial representatives, but not nine that can virtually dominate all decisions. Um, and importantly, you know that the, you know, there's been a lot of issues relating to corruption. The CFO is now a member of the board, which in terms of legal speak is an important thing in terms of personal responsibility for the decisions that you make. I have some concern. I mean, there's, there's clearly a move by DOH to try and control. And the relative dominance of Department of Health representatives on the board is something that you will need to manage because you need to manage over time that one of your biggest partners has a board which... I'm sure we'll be making all the right decisions in terms of the individual's contribution to it, but there will always be a contested space as to where resources go. And as an academic uh, institution, you need to just ensure that all of this into the future, and I'm talking about in a 20-year cycle, that everything is important. And it links to the next slide, and that is that the powers of the minister are substantially increased in this one. The minister can hire and fire um, um, uh, oops, sorry. The minister in, in the current act has to go to court to get rid of me as a board member, essentially. Whereas in the new one, it's really just on the minister's due diligence, which is not described. He can wake up and do due diligence over breakfast and get rid of me. Uh, it's not described, whereas at the moment he needs to go to court, in theory, to get rid of me if, if I object. So I think it's important to see that Although the NHLS will remain outside, the new act is looking to a much more controlled environment, a bit like it being a department within the DOH that it has full control over. And there are benefits and, 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 and problems associated with any of these models. I, I, I don't make, uh, none of my comments are meant to suggest any, uh, anything negative about the minister or the ministry. But it's, it's, about, it's about the normal power dynamics of who makes the decisions. So there also are reforms to the clinical platform, and, and it's important that we plan into the future because I think we've been through quite a tricky patch, and the board is absent, the new acting CEO is absolutely adamant that we need to return to a pathologist-led organization. I think there have been some serious challenges in that in the last few years, and this is going to be an emerging theme of substance in the organization, returning us back to being data-driven organization within which we serve the, our community. Um, and I'm not for one moment suggesting that the pathologists are more important than any of the technologists or technicians. 
everybody is important in this space, but the, 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 the drive to return to, to the pathologist-led pathologist -led service is, a, is, a, is an emerging, re-emerging and dominant theme. Then being NHI aligned is very important. At one time, we weren't too sure if the NHLS was going to have to compete with the private sector in the NHI environment, district by district for the services. It looks like that battle's been won and that the NHLS will A, be, continue into the future and B, will continue to be the sole provider of pathology services to every public health uh, um, clinic. And then there is the so-called roadmap, which is the clinical uh, and associated administrative strategy for improving the clinical uh, activities, to provide a more cost-effective service, a, a service that has a far more efficient uh, courier and logistics service, uh, with increased uh, access to pathologists in the so-called national coverage uh, process that is, that is emerging. We, we look to the future where in some of the disciplines uh, where there's a, an acute shortage, like uh, anatomical pathology, there's only one in the whole of KwaZulu-Natal. You cannot run a service like that, so you have to start looking at a hub of specialists to, to, to run that. Um, uh, there's probably going to be a, a significant infrastructure investment associated with a, a, a conditional grant and a far level, a greater level of automation. And we know that IT has been one of those areas which we've just had no ability to invest um, in, and we will, I anticipate that we will improve our IT and be able to, 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 to manage that far better. But there's going to, I anticipate that there's going to be a modernization of services initiative uh, which will be, have a, a, a different and higher level of intensity. At the clinical level, we're going to have to look at providing services with a far greater number of, uh, of, of specimens coming through the front door. And this is the last few years showing uh, that although the Department of Health is trying to drop the number of specimens coming through the front door of the NHLS, in fact, they're going up, and they're going up at, at quite considerable levels. And the current debt is in part due to non-payment, but it's also due to the fact that we're getting about a six to eight, now this year, 4.7 to, to 8% increase in, in revenues uh, from the Department of Health, but a 13, 15, 17% increase in specimens. So we've got challenges there. And what's driving that is the so-called national priority program of HIV and TB. And what we see is a spectacular increase in the viral loads. We're gonna see a decrease in CD4, not down to, 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 to very low levels, but a decreased prominence of CD4 and a lot more in the area of gene expert and other TB tests, which is driving the volumes up substantially. And as we move from what was 1.8, 2, 2.5, now um, 3.5 million people on antiretrovirals, we want to get 6 million people onto antiretrovirals. That's going to increase even more. And the budgets need to accommodate for that. But this is the driver of increased volumes. And so what is the future? I, I hope that as in this process of, of giving some of the history and where we are, the challenges of where we are, and some of the, the, uh, the, 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 the management interventions, I'm not trying to in any way wish away, or well, I'm trying to wish away, but that doesn't work. I'm tr not trying to diminish the challenges. The challenges are substantial and they have been long term. But I do think that in a longer time frame, there is a real desire at a high level and a real commitment within the NHLS to try and turn this around. Unlike previously where we have lacked political support, we have politi political support. And people are not paying us because they're bankrupt, not because they don't want to pay us. We're seeing reforms in governance, we're seeing reforms on the financial system and processes, and we're seeing the NHLS Act uh, and, and NAPISA Act uh, being enacted next year probably, and this will introduce positive reforms. What we are also seeing is a different level of executive accountability. And the one thing that I might have skirted over is the fact that in the previous financial year, there was 28 million rand of unexplained, exp unauthorized expenditure. And two weeks ago, we launched, uh, we, we, we had to acknowledge that there were just under a billion rand of unapproved expenditure in the NHLS. And this is a very, very serious thing because we have had challenges and I'm going to have to be circumspect for the next couple of weeks because there are, there are legal processes in place that I cannot prejudice. But we have to acknowledge that there have been challenges within the NHLS that are analogous to the challenges in other sectors where in the other sectors they've talked about capture. 
and there's a new level of executive accountability with the CEO, the CFO, the head of supply chain management, and two or three others who are suspended and on, on, on disciplinary, uh, in disciplinary proceedings. There's a new level of executive accountability, and I don't want to say too much more unless I prejudice the cases and we, and we have other challenges. But the management pra practices are also improving, and, and I want you to know that, that the board is taking this very seriously. I think that we also need to understand that we have good relationships with most provinces, actually. They're all paying their bills and they, they thank us for the services. And the issue of whether we are a going concern or not is clear. If the provinces pay, we're a going concern. It's not, we, we do have debt, but we can, we can find mechanisms to overcome that. We need civil society to say it's unacceptable that government doesn't pay for a basic human right provision. That 70% of clinical decisions are based on a pathology result and that we only are going concern if provinces pay. There has to be some kind of community-based uh, uh, realization and action around that. The future is definitely around modernization of the services and I've talked about the roadmap and the importance of NHI. But I think that we are incredibly uh, fortunate to have the partnerships that we have, the universities, the universities of technology, provinces, national, and, and a variety of others, which, um, which really add to the quality, the, 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 the tapestry of pathology in, um, in, in the country. Perhaps for one moment I can speak to you as an, I don't think anything I've said to you now has been as a board member, but perhaps I can just say one of the things that, as a board member, and that is that we need to bear in mind that although the a slight tweaking of the objects of the service in the NHLS amendment bill, Service, teaching, training, and research remain legally entrenched mandates of the organization in collaboration with its partners. And we need to find ways to do that as best as possible. But it also wouldn't be appropriate for me to stand up here and not acknowledge that in the recent past, the last couple of years, there have been certain unfortunate executive signals sent out to universities and academic institutions suggesting that there was a diminishing of the, of the role, a diminishing of the importance of the role. And I just want to ensure that you know that that is not an organizational reality. That is not an organizational position. And those of you in pathology know that there was a special board resolution relating to our relationship with the academic centers and the importance thereof. I really want that to be a strong signal. And, and I know that Eric Buch, the chair of the board, and, and, and the fellow board members feel um, equally strongly about that. We have a remarkable service and dedication with all three mandates. And, and thanks to, to the pathologists, the technologists, the, the te the, the, and the other technical staff, we've got through some difficult, con uh, difficult conditions, particularly with a strike recently within which pathologists were not only signing out results, but they were feeding horses in the, in the paddocks at the NHLS head office where they do the, the vaccine work. Uh, we have an engaged and supportive leadership, all committed to the vision of the NHLS, which is Africa's Center for Excellence for Innovative Laboratory Medicine. So, Landa, thank you for the invitation to be here. It really is an amazing privilege to come and talk.